Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Christina Picard. I'm a contributing editor with Wine Enthusiast. I provide coverage and reviews on the wines of New Zealand and Australia. Firstly, I'd like to thank our sponsor, New Zealand Wine Growers, or NZW, uh, or NZW, depending on what country you're in, uh, which is the national organization for the country's grape and wine sector. The purpose of New Zealand Wine Growers is twofold to protect and enhance the reputation of New Zealand wine, to support sustainable, diversified value growth of New Zealand wine. The purpose of uh, New Zealand Wine Growers Global Marketing Program is to develop and support the growth of New Zealand wine in the country's major markets around the world. So New, New Zealand Wine Growers provide advocacy on behalf of the grape and wine sector. They facilitate world-class research, provide timely strategic info for the wine, or, wine industry, lead the development of sustainable production practices and publish a wealth of information online, including the latest research, market data, statistics, and better best practice guides. So I would highly recommend checking out their website. It's www.nz or nzwine.com. Uh, it is bookmarked uh, on the tabs of my computer and I use it all the time. I don't know how I'd live without it. So I'm very grateful to New Zealand Wine Growers for that excellent website and resource that they provide. I'm thrilled to be here in this virtual space with you all today talking about a very important topic for both New Zealand and for the wine world as a whole, sustainability. Sustainability is a term that gets bandied about a lot and it can be interpreted fairly broadly. So what I'm hoping to dive into today with our three fabulous panelists who I'm going to introduce in a minute is how deeply committed New Zealand is to sustainability from an environmental, social and economic perspective. How the wine industry there has defined and implemented this term and how wine growers uphold it. So to give you an idea of how integral sustainable practices are to the Kiwis, think about this. New Zealand was the first in the wine industry to establish a national sustainability program called Sustainable Wine Growing New Zealand, or SWNZ, SWNZ, or as the Kiwis call it, SWINS. Uh, they established that in 1994. It was introduced commercially to the entire industry in 1997. More than 20 years later, New Zealand is still one of the world's leaders in sustainability, with 98% of New Zealand's vineyard producing area certified by SWINS. That's 87,866 acres certified as sustainable. Organics and biodynamics are also a big part of New Zealand wine. 10% of New Zealand wineries now hold organic certification. Go to the next slide. So today we're going to be speaking with three of New Zealand's most renowned winemakers. We have Clive Jones, the winemaker and general manager at Nautilus Estate in Marlborough. Hi, Clive. Uh, Erica Crawford, the founder and driving force behind Love Block Wine in Marlborough and also in Central Otago. And as a side note, Erica and her husband Kim are also the founders and former owners of one of New Zealand's biggest export brands, Kim Crawford. Hi, Erica. And finally, Julian Grounds, the chief winemaker at Craigie Range in Hawks, Hawks Bay. Hi, Julian. Hi. We can move to the next slide. Feel free to send us any questions you might have throughout the webinar, and we'll do our very best to answer as many of them as possible at the end of the webinar. So you'll notice uh, an attendee toolbar. There's a question mark icon that you can click on. So type your question into the Dropbox and click send. That's it. And as I said, we'll try and answer as many of those as we can once the webinar wraps up. Also, there are several handouts that will be provided for you to download, and they'll be made available after the event as well. One is a comprehensive guide to all things New Zealand wine by region and great varieties, uh, which should be a really interesting read, uh, just to get an overview of New Zealand wine as a whole. The others are some interesting reading about the overall impact of food miles on sustainability. Uh, and we've included today's presentation as well. You should see them all on the handout tab, the handouts tab uh, on the side of your control panel. Next slide. So uh, let's get started. I'd like to introduce Clive Jones now, uh, the winemaker and general manager at Nautilus Estate, as I mentioned, in Marlborough. Clive has been a winemaker at Nautilus Estate for 22 years. He has a background in industrial chemistry and a degree in wine science. 
Clive and his team have a reputation for producing consistently expressive, textural, and highly drinkable Marlboro wines. I can attest to that. I have been drinking your wines, Clive, for many years, since the very start of my wine career, and they have always been consistently delicious. Uh, the Nautilus Estate Vineyards, Grower Blocks, and Winery are all 100% certified as by Sustainable Wine Growers New Zealand and have been for a number of years. Clive, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Christina, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining us for this discussion. Hopefully it's uh, going to be very interesting to you and uh, a bit of fun as well. So um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of sustainability from a, a New Zealand perspective to set the scene, and I think, think the other two speakers will probably dive, dive down a little bit deeper into their personal experiences. But if we just put the first slide up, um, just as a reminder of, of what Christina said, that you know we have had this nationwide program that was established or, or went nationwide in 1997, and, and we've got this quite remarkable 20 years later of 98% of New Zealand's vineyard area or producing area is certified. And, and that statistic about, you know, in the high 90s has been in place for about 10 years now. So certainly as an industry, we were very quick to adopt, embrace the concept of sustainability and have a really good uptake. And I guess over the, over the last number of years, we've seen a lot of other nations and, and, and wine industries develop their own programs. So, you know, how do, how do we stack up against it? We, we, we certainly were the first, um, but just because you, you're the first doesn't mean to say that you're the best. Um, and, and, and when we kind of review it against other um, nations, we do think we, we're right up there in terms of being leading for sure. So if we go to the next slide. So what, rather than necessarily benchmark against other um, sustainable wine growing programs, we, we thought let's go back to the basics, let's go to the United Nations Sustainability Goals. And, and there, you know, when the, when the program started, there was a technical focus in the, in the vineyards and wineries. So it was about measuring, reducing inputs and waste streams. So you've got the three focus areas there at the top, water, waste and pest and disease. But looking at those sustainability, United Nations sustainability goals, we wanted to sort of take a broader approach or a more holistic approach. So relatively recently, we've decided to introduce two new focus areas, uh, that of climate change and of people. So climate change is certainly front of mind these days, and we want to understand not only the effect of climate change on viticulture, on our operations, but also the impact of our activities and how we can you know, reduce our impact on the environment. The people are hugely important to wine growing and, and, and while there's some things we can mechanise, we, you know, we, we still rely on people to carry out a lot of tasks in the vineyards and wineries. And we're not only concerned about safety, but also um, health and wellbeing are just as important too. So, you know, a much broader approach to our, to our people. You know, when you, when you think about a lot of our vineyards, they're, they're all, the vast majority of them are hand pruned. Um, we're in a cool climate, our, our viticulture is quite intensive. So, you know, if you actually count the number of times someone handles a vine throughout the growing season, it's quite a high number. It'd be well over a dozen times. Each individual um, vine is actually hand, handled by a person rather than a machine. So, and, and just as another note that we, we're actually looking at expanding the program to a new focus area, which is going to be about soil health. So one of the strengths of the sustainable wine growing New Zealand system is, is we've continued to evolve it and, and that will always continue as well. So we just go to the next slide. And as we sort of, sort of thought more about sustainability, we've come to the realisation that there are concepts embraced by the Māori and our Indigenous people that are very applicable to wine growing and our sustainability program. So what I'd like to do is introduce a couple of concepts to you. And the first concept is Turanga Waiwai, or place where you stand. And if you like, this is the New Zealand version of terroir, the French concept. And it helps us really develop a sense of place as a wine grower. So having a strong connection to place, which in this case is a vineyard, it, it makes a lot of sense from a wine growing point of view, and it can actually be a very, very powerful concept. If you're strongly connected to the land, you're more likely to be concerned about sustainability. And one of the things you do as a New Zealander when you introduce yourself is you talk about your mountain and your river. So not only do you 
stand on your your land or, or, your, or your place you're connected to, your two-day YY, -Y, but you look out to a broader view as well too, and you identify the mountain and the river that's closest to you. So when we look in this picture, you can see a mountain range in the in the background, and that mountain range will actually have quite an influence on this particular vineyard in the picture as well too. So it may be a, a, a provide shelf from wind or, or or create a rain shadow to protect um, the the vineyard from from rainfall. And along the bottom of that that mountain range will be a river too, and that river is most likely to be the source of water to the vineyard. So, you know, taking that more holistic approach and looking at the broad environment really, you know, makes sense from a wine growing point of view. So that's, you know, why this, this concept of two angle wide has become very powerful in recent years in the wine industry. If we go to the next slide, the second concept that I'd like to introduce you is kaitiati tanga. And this is taking responsibility for guardianship and protection of your place. So we've identified our place, our Turanga Waiwai, and now we want to protect it. So this view is less about ownership and more about guardianship. <coughs> you know, and when you when you you know steward, stewardship and also so taking care for the next generation. So when you view sustainability through the lens of, you know, this lens it naturally takes you to a broader view and nicely aligns with that focus in, on climate change and people as well too. And all this coincides with New Zealand wine moving from sort of a rapid expansion phase to a much more mature phase of consolidation and long-term planning. So many businesses are looking at succession to the next generation as well. And that next generation is, for them, it's all about sustainability. So it's becoming a, a lot bigger focus for, for many businesses. So having the structure of the SWINS program in place, it has made it much easier to take a broad approach and introduce new concepts and, and priorities of the program as it develops over time. And we're already seeing it developing further in, in future years with the new, concept, new, new focus area on soil. So if we go to the last slide of my slides, um, I'd just like to finish with a, a Maori proverb. And that's when you ask the question, what is the most important thing in the world? The answer is he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is the people, it is the people, it is the people. The wine industry has always had a great sense of camaraderie within the industry, but now we are looking much more to embrace the community around us as well. So hopefully that's kind of set the scene. I might just pass that back to you, Christina. And um, yeah, that was great. Thank you, Clive. Yeah. So you you mentioned um, you know a little bit about the longevity and how long standing New Zealand sustainability program is, and how now you know and how you have to kind of keep it strong over those years. So, so there's other sustainable program sustainability programs throughout the world, um, and so how does New Zealand sort of continue to be a leader? A leader in it and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the logistics of sustainable wine growers New Zealand with regards to how they're able to audit wine growers to ensure they're meeting the standards of the program is there also on top of that kind of a, a peer watchdog mentality where one producer might be called out say for taking shortcuts you know how do you monitor something as as big as sustainability and as broad as, as encompassing as that term is Sure. So when, when you join the scheme, um, you go through an audit process at the end of one year. So that's an independent audit. There's, uh, there's auditors, auditors that are, and these are sort of, this is what they do. They're, they're, um, they audit for various schemes and concepts and they, you know, they're contracted to audit the, audit the SWIN scheme. So you're audited in that first year and then every three years after that so in the years between you self-audit so you have to submit a court scorecard so it's all done online and um and that will automatically pick up anything that where you've got a corrective action or anything like that so it's a it's a pretty robust system i think but we've also um we do rely on peer pressure absolutely because while new zealand wine growers runs this scheme we don't actually any have any authority to prosecute, for instance. You know, we, we, we're not the police, so we can't, um, we, you know, we can call people out, we can reduce their, um, or, or suspend them from their membership. But what we would generally do is, if they've breached a regulation, then we go to the regulatory authority and inform them, and they would then do the actual enforcement. So um, 
we can't do it. We can't, we can't wave the big stick ourselves as an organization, but, um, but certainly we can put a bit of pressure on for sure. And surely there's got to be a little bit of a herd mentality there too, where if all your neighbors are working to a certain standard, you don't want to be the one, the one winery who's not. I would think to some extent. Absolutely, and it, and it was really interesting to see how the, um, the sustainability got adopted, and, and there was a bit of a tipping point where um, you know a new scheme, and, and there were the, the pioneers, the, the real trailblazers and enthusiasts, um, but it got to the point where you know everyone just suddenly said, right, we've 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 got to all embrace this, and and, and New Zealanders, we, we we are great at looking over the fence, you know, we we want to try something. We, generally see what the neighbour's doing and if we like that we'll copy it ourselves. So um, it was it was quite amazing to see how quickly it was adopted and we got up to that high percentage. And and I mean you in terms of looking over the fence, I think a lot of countries were looking over the fence at New Zealand when the program was started. You guys really were leaders leaders in this program. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that's where we um, again, but just because you're leaders at the start doesn't mean to say that um, you know that will ever forever be the case. So we've been very conscious of of keeping up to you know up to date, and we have you know compared our system to other systems, and we, and we've learned things as well for sure. But that's where we actually ultimately we went back to go. Well, what do we want to benchmark against? We want to benchmark against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So you know take it right back to the whole concept of or worldwide concepts of sustainability and see how we align with that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Clive. I appreciate that. Okay. So moving on to our next panelist, uh, I would next like to introduce Erica Crawford, who is the owner, viticulturist, and driving force behind Love Block Wine, which is also in Marlborough in the Awatere Valley subregion. And the Crawfords also have a vineyard in central Otago as well. So Erica, as you will soon hear, is not a native New Zealander. And actually, there's four different accents on this panel. <laughs> Only one native <laughs> New Zealander, which is Clive, come to think of it. Uh, Erica is originally from South Africa. A former medical scientist, Erica met her husband, Kim, um, in South Africa, and the pair moved to Kim's native New Zealand. Kim and Erica created the Kim Crawford brand in 1996, which they rapidly built into a household name and subsequently sold nine years later. They started a new and very different label, Love Block, planting and farming organically and sustainably from the get-go and making wine entirely from their own fruit. On Love Block's website, Erica says, life forced me to carefully and progressively examine the chemical nature of our immediate environment. I slowly started eliminating additives, colorants, and stimulants from my diet and life. The effect was cumulative and I gradually embraced organics. Erica is an active member of the Global Women New Zealand Advisory Board and she holds a number of directorships both in the wine industry and in other sectors. So she's a force to be reckoned with. Welcome, Erica. Oh, that's a very nice description. Thank you, Christina. And hello, America. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit more about and take you a step beyond this Swins um, system that Clyde has been talking about. But firstly, just want to take you to my first slide that tells you about this small but mighty little place in the South Pacific and the importance that the land has for us. You know, it's a small little island. Um, the soils are fertile and the climate's relatively gentle. It's, it's very temperate. So um, we end up being net producers of agricultural products. You know, New Zealand has one of the biggest dairy companies in the world. So we feed a lot of people milk all over the world. It's known for its wool and fabulous lamb chops. Mm -hmm. And of course, cool climate apples and kiwi fruit. So it's very, New Zealand is very bound to the land. Um, and it's a very important thing. It's a major asset for us in, in everything that we do. And for instance, you know, right now with ur urban expansion, it's expanding into the fertile soils of an area called Pukekohe where we grow a lot of New Zealand's vegetables. So the government is looking at legislation to protect areas like that. Um, otherwise, urban expansion, we, you know, we'll build houses on some of the most fertile soils and we have to feed millions. New Zealand grows food and of course, um, lovely wine. So today I want to talk to you just a little bit more about organics and, and, and really why we and why other practitioners do it. And you see people who do that, um, you know, in the past years ago, people used to think of um, organics as people, 
you know, hippies um, being earnest, but it's way beyond that. It's for me, the young people that I see, that's forcing us to change our ways. And um, for me, of course, it's been a personal journey and it's sort of gone into the land. And um, it's a deep philosophical thing for most organic producers. It's not just a matter of cut, cutting out herbicides and pesticides and chemicals. It goes far beyond that. It goes to that soil uh, that, that Clive spoke about. And, and, and it really is farming with intent and mindfulness. So if we go to the second slide there for me, you will see um, that organics perhaps it doesn't only revolve around growing grapes. We're looking at a holistic system. Um, and it's a system that's growing quite fast in New Zealand, you know, in Hawke's Bay, in Wairarapa, in Marlborough, there are a big number of producers and 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 particularly in central Otago, you know, they're really embracing it over there. So we're not looking at only at the crop that we're growing, we're looking at that whole holistic system. So in our case, obviously we grow grapes, that's our major crop, but we also, the, the whole farm is a big organic farm, you know, it's something like 168 hectares of which only about 30% is planted in grapes. So what happens to the rest? The rest is all certified organic too, and it's, um, we have 200 head of cattle. So we also have to look at how do we commercialize these other things that we use um, in the process of doing organics. So hopefully soon we'll be able to serve you Luftlock organic grass-fed beef. And so it's a system. So the animals we use on the, on the vineyards, you'll often see pictures of New Zealand vineyards with sheep um, loitering around between the rows and, and the cows do the same thing. You know, they eat, they, instead of putting a tractor through uh, with, a, with a lawnmower, the cattle and the sheep go in there and they do that for us and they do a jolly good job of that as well, of course. Um, so I think it's also particularly relevant, this biodiversity that we're talking about here in this time of COVID, you know, um, viruses happen and they happen all the time. So if we have a monoculture, so, and it happens in countries, it happens everywhere, you know, um, where we plant, say, only grapes, then if a virus happens, it can just, it makes that crop so much more vulnerable. If you plant and do other things amongst this, then it reduces that vulnerability and it strengthens, for instance, the soil. So it does all sorts of things, but the one little thing that I want to point out, so amongst the roots of plants, there's millions, it's a, it's a whole little subpopulation, millions and millions of little bacteria and fungi and things living there that all contribute to good soil that gives you, of course, better plants and the and, and less need for intervention. So soil health is one of the really important things. And how does that contribute to wine, you may ask? Um, how do we see the difference there? So you'll see with organic wine, um, often it's more textured um, on the palate and, um, and, and, and because the vines have to fight with weeds that grow underneath and cover crops that grow between the rows, the aromatics are not as big. So all of these things are happening um, when we look at an, an, a holistic system. Another thing that we do on this on this Lovelock farm is, for instance, um, you know, you keep a nutrient loop. So everything that comes off that farm goes back onto the farm in terms of compost. So, you know, grape mark, um, prunings, cow manure, hay, all sorts of things. And then that goes back onto the farmer's fertilizer. So it's this lovely nutrient loop and closed and a closed closed system. I want to get back to the wine again, um, because I think it's quite an important point for us to make. What we see now after 12 years in organics is that in our case, the wines start fermenting on their own yeast. So we don't need to inoculate. So you get this concept of the wild yeast. So it truly just speaks to that piece of land. Um, and there's much less to hide behind. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, see if you can see the difference next time. Next time you 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 open a bottle of organic wine. Um, people, of course, as you'll see on the next slide here, um, are really important. And Clive also alluded to that. And I just quickly want to touch on this um, permaculture issue. So, permaculture means that it's part of a community. So 
it means that everybody who works on the farm, whether it's the guy coming to fix the tractor, whether it's the crews coming to do the pruning, whether it's our own staff, whether it's the neighbors, must be able to be fed from the farm. So we have a massive vegetable garden there and people help themselves. So it must be able to feed other people. And there you'll see lovely Swiss chard. And as I said, we talked about the beef. And so that's something that, um, that um, I, I think is really also quite important is that whole thing of sharing. I think COVID's also told us a thing or two about that because grow your own stuff. It's, you know, sometimes all you need is a little pot, give it a go. The last thing I think that's quite important that you'll see on the next slide here is the, the role of the carbon footprint. Now, New Zealand government, together with other governments, signed the Paris Accord. And I, I'm thinking it was the end of 2015 or 16, something like that, something like that, with the aim of being carbon neutral by 2050. Now, it's not that many years away in the bigger scheme of things. So as a wine industry, that's quite a challenging thing. So how do we contribute to that? And how do we all become carbon neutral? Um, so first of all, um, New Zealand as a, as, a, as a nation, you know, energy is one of the biggest things that contribute to a, a big carbon footprint. And 86.6% of New Zealand's electricity or energy is renewable. So that already makes us a lot more efficient. And, you know, that's again, some of the riches that, that the land has in such abundance. Um, so if we look at that bottle of wine, what makes up the carbon footprint for that bottle of wine? So you'll see 32% comes from the grape growing and the wine making. 3%, I've just got to drop my little text box there because I can't see. 3% comes from waste disposal. 16% from energy, and then New Zealand would be smaller because of our renewables. 3% from refrigeration and 46%, a mighty 46% from packaging. So I'm just going to touch quickly on the grape growing and winemaking. So what are we doing there to, come, you know, to reduce the, the, the carbon production? So they're looking at machineries and, um, you know, to, to make them so that they're less dependent on fossil fuels. And, but of course, you know, you need practice and I'm not sure if electric vehicles can power a little sprayer behind them or something. So it's something, but it's actually not a big part. If you think of what we do, we grow the grapes and we make them. Another part that spontaneously happens is there's quite a bit of carbon produced when the wines ferment. So probably the winemakers and the company around just viticulturists can tell us more about that. But um, we're certainly looking at the winery and see how we get at the vineyards how can, and how can we reduce the carbon footprint but the biggest thing is the packaging a mighty 46 percent of a bottle of wine sits in the packaging and if we break that down the label and the carton and the screw cap or the or the cork doesn't make up a big part so if you look at the whole bottle i think it's something like 38 percent of the whole bottle is glass and that's quite you know quality cues for us. How would you like your Napa cab that you pay $110 for to come in a light bottle? But these are the things that we're going to have to consider because if we change to a lighter bottle, we shave 15% of the carbon footprint of that bottle of wine. That's really quite important. And I think I'd love to have some feedback from you guys in the audience. How do you feel about that? Because I think we're going to have to do this thing, you know? The other thing also that people talk about is New Zealand, as you know, if you look at the world map, is really far away from everything. It's a tiny island nation, so we have to cart our stuff everywhere. And on the right of the slide there, you'll see an aeroplane, a truck, and a big freighter. So aeroplanes, obviously, that's the highest footprint of all of all um, things that you can freight around the world. So that's, that's why we've avoided the all cost. Truck second, you know, land transport. But containers, big freighters are actually incredibly efficient because if you think about it, you put a lot of a lot of freight in a ship like that and it only uses so much so much um, energy. Other thing for New Zealand also, if we look at the US, you know, we can ship things directly to the East Coast to its nearest port. 
So we don't necessarily send it to one port and one place and one warehouse in the US. We can go to Florida, we can go to Texas, we can go to New Jersey, we can go to New York, way up there. And then it needs to be, I guess, transported into the into the middle um, using trucks, but the truck usage is actually quite low. So another thing in I think that New Zealand does quite well in these faraway countries, it's not that we do it, it's we have to do it, is our transport is quite efficient too. So all up, I think that this tiny little nation at the bottom of the at the bottom of the world is a mighty little one. And and I hope you you enjoy the wine um, when you drink it and um, be sure that you've got a team of five million who's doing more and more and more to reduce our footprint on this earth. Thank you, Erica. That was excellent. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, so you have vineyards in the Aotearoa Valley, the subregion uh, in Marlborough, and then you also have your Pinot Noir vineyard down in central Otago, Otago which just to orientate some of uh, some of our attendees who may not be as familiar with the, the map of New Zealand. So Marlborough would be at the northeast corner of the South Island and uh, central Otago further southwest. So down towards the sort of western half of the South Island, mm. bo bottom western half of the South Island, we'll say. Um, so is that that vineyard in central Otago is certified sustainable, but not organic, uh, like your Great. home blocks in Marlborough are. So could you talk about the difference uh, in farming and the choice not to move forward with organics for this vineyard? Is it, are there climates? I mean, this is sort of also a broader question wrapped in that, but are there climates where it's easier to work sustainably and organically than others? Or is it as much a social and cultural thing? We were talking about the herd mentality thing last, um, with Clive. And you know, if your neighbors are working this way, you might be more likely to farm this way too. So I guess first, if you could talk about your, specifically your vineyards and then the bigger picture of, is it easier in some places of New Zealand than others, or is the whole country yeah. sort of the same in that regard? For us, that vineyard, um... It's still relatively young and we've learned our lesson, trust me, we've gone organic without planning too far ahead. So what I've learned is that in our case, it's best to go bit by bit. So it's a little bit like having ground zero there as your aim and then starting to eliminate things. For the soil at that vineyard is quite depleted. So what we're doing at the moment is building the organic matter in the soil and getting that ready. And once that that has been brought up to standard then we look at removing herbicides and then we look at removing other pesticides so it's a stepwise process and with time these the, the vines definitely get a bit more get more resistant to disease pressures etc so so it's a time thing and we're now in the soil phase and but we're definitely working towards that every year in Marlborough and the Marlborough vineyards also because the holdings are uh, there's another property about 45 hectares. So every year we put three hectares in conversion and into organics because it's not easy. You know, it's not an easy thing. And in some places it's just too hard to do because some of our vineyards um, are so stony. You know, it's really hard because to because you've got to cut the weeds. You don't spray them dead. You have to mow the weeds. So. Obviously, your equipment will just get decimated if continue knock stones. So in some places, it's really hard. But you know, people are coming up with 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 um, innovative ideas such as um, certified organic weed matting that takes us around that point. So in some places, it's hard. In some places, you can't. But um, you know, we we will ex extend the, the 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 organic footprint as far as we can across the state. So the sheep, the sheep wouldn't do enough in terms of in terms of natural mowing. They just don't eat fast enough. Or <laughs> well, well, we take them out at a certain stage. Otherwise, they damage the vines and they you know, eat, the, eat the grapes at some point, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thank you, Erica. We're going to move on to our last panelist now, and then we'll take questions. As I mentioned, we've got some really great questions coming in from attendees that we'll uh, we'll take at the end. But we're going to move over to Julian now. Uh, so. For our last speaker, I'd like to introduce Julian Grounds, the chief winemaker at Craigie Range, a label many of you may be familiar with. Julian is originally from Western Australia, which uh, was once my neck of the woods as well. He is a veteran of the wine industry, having worked in it since he was 17. 
Julian has made wine in Burgundy, Margaret River, Central Otago, and Oregon, including at renowned wineries like Giant Steps in the Yarra Valley and the biodynamic McHenry Honan in Margaret River, which, as a side note, uh, was co-founded by David Honan, who also founded Cloudy Bay in New Zealand. So it's a small little wine world. Julian joined the ubiquitous Craigie Range as chief winemaker in January 2019. While Craigie Range owns vineyards in Hawke's Bay, Martinborough, and Marlborough, the main winery is located in the heart of the Gimlet Gravels Wine Growing District in Hawke's Bay. Julian, a very warm welcome. Uh, thanks so much, Christina, and uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, look, we'll dive straight into it because I'm sure there's going to be uh, some uh, great questions at the end to kind of explore. So um, if we go to the first slide there. Yeah. And so I think, um, I, I mean, we've had like a great snapshot where we've started out quite broad talking about what has made New Zealand special as a country. And then um, Eric has kind of explored some of the inherent concepts to what they're doing. And, and I'd kind of like to take that as well to talk about um, both regionally and as a brand where we see sustainability shaping into the future. And I think that the really important fact for this is that you've seen that we're actually we've got almost 100% buying as a country for a sustainability program. So we're not having to go through, uh, you know, a region to region um, differences in strategy. We've actually, we've actually adopted a strategy as a country. And I think that's put us in a really strong position to talk about things that are probably at a higher level than a lot of countries can talk about because they're still trying to adopt what would be a regional or national strategy. So you know, I think that kind of underestimated is that SWINS or, you know, sustainable wine growing has been a really great um, galvaniser as a country for a strategy that we can kind of follow as a footprint. And then if you want to add, I suppose, your cherry on top as your, you know, whether it be biodynamic or biodiversity programs, then you can do that. But that, that hygiene requirement now is set. And um, I think that that's, it's, it's unique and, and it's something that should be celebrated. But like, uh, like we've all talked about, we're not resting on those laurels. So um, now as a country, we are geologically very young, but also as an industry, I suppose, whilst we've had wine, uh, we've just celebrated um, the bicentenary of um, grape growing in the country. But realistically, it's been the, um, the kind of, since the 70s and 80s is the modern incarnation of grape growing. So there's a lot of, companies which are about to go through a generational shift where they'll be handing on to the to the next generations but um, sons or daughters or other family members and so a big part of sustainability is obviously is making sure that your business business is relevant you know, uh, what are we doing what are we growing what are we making is it what the world's uh, demanding um, because there's no point you know being um, a, an ethical and sustainable producer if if the end product at the end is not what is required. So I think that we, especially in the last kind of 10 to 15 years, have been amazing at now focusing on um, on that relevance, relevance as a brand, but also um, part of that is born of evolution. So um, if I look at the Craigie example, whilst we we're only 21 years old um, as a brand, or uh, we planted our first vines actually back in 98, we've replanted about 50% of our vineyard area already. And that was born out of what did we have the wrong clones, where we have the wrong varieties on soil types. And I, I don't think that shows, um, I don't think it's cluttered mindset. I actually think it shows that there's a willingness for us all as wine producers, because it's the same in Hawke's Bay. If you looked at Hawke's Bay about what we were growing compared to where we are now, that has been an evolution in itself. And so there's an there's a inherent um, willingness to be adaptable to to what is the best um, vines for what you should be growing. And, and I think that that's really held us now where I would say comfortably most of us are really happy that we are growing the right uh, varieties in region. And that's, um, that's part of maturity as a wine growing country that we are now um, feel that whether it be um, predominantly Sauvignon Blanc in, in Marlborough or predominantly Pinot Noir in Central Otago, that we are, we are now um, firmly in that camp that we think we have the right varieties and, and be that climate change may I change that um, into the future, but but it's now it's we're looking at how how do we make that? Be? Is it mass oil selection programs? Is it um, the use of stems in, in the in the wineries? And and I think we could only do that um, because we are a small um, and and spirited nation that has that desire to to change. And and I that is a, a quality that's inherent to New Zealanders. So if we move into the next slide. There, it, it kind of is is the um, 
this is what kind of forms what we uh, as a country and also um, for us at Craggy Range, um, this like kind of a tree to, to achieve sustainability. And first and foremost, without economic stability uh, as a wine growing country or as your individual brands, it's very hard um, to achieve a meaningful change in the social and environmental sustainability. So I think that's been the focus for a lot of us. And um, I mean, if you look at the, the export prices that we're able to achieve now, um, and that's that it can be 100% put down to wine quality and and the strength of our brand in that people know that when they buy New Zealand wine, it's a unique and high quality product. It has then allowed us to to start to put the the amount of time and energy that is required to have meaningful sustainable programs in the social and environmental. And for us, I think that we we kind of um, you know for the first years it was trying to figure out, or, you know, who are we and what are we and how do we achieve that sustainable economic model. But definitely in the last three years, we feel comfortable that we sit in that, and that that, that we have we're aware now that there is there is big avenues and big um, big changes to be had in the social and environmental sustainability if that's what we want to sit comfortably when we all sleep go to sleep at night. So. Um, I suppose the, the key programs that have formed that um, is where we hope to achieve sustainability as a loop. So we'll touch on the first one if we if we move to the first, the next slide there. So this is part of our environmental sustainability program is a, is a huge um, uh, kind of step into the biodiversity. And, and I, I've been reading a lot lately that I think biodiversity is where globally a lot of us as wine producers see um, big gains to be had because uh, we we kind of realized for quite a um, quite a while that um, a, a viticulture a vineyard by nature is generally a monoculture and granted with with organics and biodynamics you can increase the diversity within row but still it's probably um, isolated from what is the immediate surroundings so the uh, the success of a biodiversity program is that basically your blip of a vineyard sets to set more comfortably into what Clive was talking about you know that on a YY from where you sit it doesn't become an anomaly it actually sits in the into the into the um, landscape if you know of what is the greater area more comfortably so we we've just begun um uh, tying into the um, Paris Accord from the New Zealand uh, Climate Change Agreement was that um, the Billion Trees Program. So uh, New Zealanders have, uh, businesses have access to, to grants to kind of allocate um, areas of their own private land to planting um, to planting trees. They don't have to be native, but, and part of the government's achievement to get a billion trees by 2055. So. Uh, down at our Martinborough vineyard, we've allocated 100 hectares to uh, to tree planting. Now, we realised quite quickly that if you look at the um, the landscape of of that vineyard, that um, it is it is native trees that is what we have cleared from the past, and that is what is needs to to kind of return if we want to look at our, our vineyard as sitting into on a YY more comfortably. So, what what we um what we've done there is we've uh, allocated that to only native programs and so um just to tie that back to wine quality there's been lots of studies lately that have kind of um conferred that native flora will give you um increased uh, microbiology into the wine and and that's kind of what we see as a side benefit of that but greater than that is just the the benefit of um having a more diverse ecology of vineyard um, and I would say just uh, just briefly that um, it's probably something that New Zealanders uh, can get away with uh, more so than other vineyards because most of our native plants don't give up off a uh, taint that can affect uh, a wine quality. And unfortunately, there is a lot of natives within other countries that do have detrimental effects from volatile oils to vineyards. So we we sit in a unique position in that um, in that context. Um, just uh, moving on to the last slide there, just to um, kind of wrap it up and um, move on to some questions. So, um, sorry, I'll just wait for that slide to come up. Oh, I think we skipped a the slide there. <laughs> um, so yeah, the the uh, the sorry, there was a previous slide to that one where we we're just talking about um, social. Um, and there we go, um, and community and our whangatanga. So um, that's just, again, um, us as a brand and a region looking at how we can 
um, support our community and 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 basically by our winery being a part of in that community um, having a positive effect on on the immediate people that uh, are are a part of that community and one thing that craggy range launched but it's not a craggy range concept it's a it's um basically um supported by all hawks bay wine growers is a children's christmas foundation that we are uh, we're packing up about 5500 um santa sacks for kids um within the region but i think it was when we started in, uh, looking at our whanatanga and our social sustainable program that we realized that there is a lot of problems and you know a third of the community living below the poverty line and i think that that's really important that as wine growers that we we don't just focus on wine quality and environmental sustainability we have a um a, a i suppose a um res a responsibility to support those in our media area so um that's just a few of the specific examples that at craggy range and in our in our um a one going areas of the Wairaka and Hawke's Bay that we're looking at, but it's just, I feel that we're really just at the tip of the iceberg, but uh, it's, it's a galvanizing aspect that I can see that a lot of the wine growers uh, have bought into. And I think the next kind of decade we'll see um, these kind of social and uh, environmental programs that uh, are probably um, world leading in their, in their um, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. I have one, uh, it's, it's a big question to, to try to answer briefly, but if you can, just because I know we're getting a little short on time and I want to make sure we get to a couple of uh, our attendees questions, but um, Craigie Range owns a little over 800 acres of vineyards along with a bit of purchased fruit. So that's pretty big. It's a pretty big, uh, uh, large business model, shall we say. So what does sustainability look like in a, in a large wineries business model as opposed to some of the smaller wineries that you've worked for like Giant Stats or McHenry Conan, which would, um, yep. which would be farming on a lot smaller scale and making wine on a smaller scale. So if you could somehow speak to that very big question yeah. briefly, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, just to touch on it briefly, I think that when you have a small team, it's really easy to supply yourself, uh, surround yourself with people that have 100% buy-in and effectively you go out there and you do all the work. So it almost becomes um, just a hand sell message. So when you're at a bigger business as we are, it's about, um, it's about basically um, having the messaging uh, probably simplified at a basic steps and um, and then that people can basically adapt the concepts um, and scale or they're scalable concepts. So I think, uh, you know, an easy one is to talk about um, why are we going from herbicide to undervine cultivation and that's a process driven model. But I think that inherently it's getting people to buy into a broader message than rather the specifics of activities, which you can do with a with a small brand. And then um, I think when you've got a whole business in line with that, it's actually then the specific operations become part of that, that inner mindset that um, that becomes normalized. But at, at the first thing, it's, uh, it's getting buy into large messaging. Hmm changing a whole culture shift then you're saying across the board with yeah the, and you, your I mean, whole team with the with the winemaking team the viticulture yeah. team and right yeah marketing team and, and the people selling your wine too so um and then it's actually becomes because i think then people start to think about why they are doing things when people think about why they are doing things it actually it creates creates pause and then then people and there's also a quality you know outcome from that as well when people are taking more time so right Thank you. Yeah. You answered that very big question very succinctly. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I know that easily we could have probably just talked about this sort of idea of how, yeah, to, yeah, we'll how to apply sustainability within business models for it's a whole other seminar, right? Yeah, we'll um, do that one another one if people want to come back in an hour. So. <laughs> right, to be continued. Yeah. So let's get a couple of questions uh, from our attendees. I wish I could get to all of them because there's some really great questions, but I am conscious of time and we've been told we are finishing at four sharp. So we're going to be try to be uh, timely about this. So let's see, the first question was, what is the difference? And this is um, for all of you, and I know some of you can answer this better than others. What is the main difference between Marlborough and Martinborough regions other than locations? Uh, how do those two areas impact the wines produced? I know in New Zealand, when I was first starting to learn about it, there's a lot of a lot of titles of things that sound the same. Of course, why meaning water, you have millions of places that start with why and all sound the same. So it took me a long time to wrap my head around that. Martinborough and Marlborough, I'm assuming that by pulling those two, those two regions out, you know, part of the, the question behind that is they sound the same. So how are they different? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I might just attack that because we actually grow in both regions, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so so uh, they are they're on the the bottom of the the North Island is Martinborough, and then the top of the South Island is Marlborough. Um, they're not too dissimilar in terms of they're both absolutely freezing for anyone who's been to Wellington um, and had the wind go through them, but. Um, very different soil types and um, geology, the age. Uh, we, we grow Sauvignon in both regions. And, it, and I suppose simplified, uh, we talk about Martinborough having um, a real mineral and phenolic and savoury edge. Uh, whereas Marlborough, we have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of power and fruit concentration, but also, again, there's a mineral, mineral thread to it. So it's a, it's a simplified answer, but, um, but uh, they are remarkably different just because basically, um, they are that kind of jump across the ocean and that and the geology that form the two regions is very different. And also technically Martinborough is the sub, is a subregion with Gladstone and Masterson within Wairarapa. That is also we we obviously know Martinborough as being the, by far the most famous of the three, but actually Martinborough technically is a subregion within the Wairarapa. So yes, it's yeah, another thing to wrap your head around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And one of the one of the key differences in climates between the two is Martinborough has more exposure to the southerlies, so yeah. to the cooler weather. So it generally has a um, a lower cropping, natural lower yeah. cropping level, and and more prone to uh, poor fruit set. So if they they are more likely to get a cold spring, which will influence the, the yeah. cropping level. Whereas yeah, those small thin, thick skinned berries. Yeah. With the yeah. windy. Yeah. Very windy. It's Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> so so whereas Marlborough being sort of on the northeast yes. corner of the South Island is a little bit more sheltered from those so southerlies by the uh, the mountain ranges to the south, the inland and speaking of Kaikoura. So quite quite different climates from like that point of view, um, even though they're on the same latitude. Mm. It's a fun exercise. Put Martin Barapino next to Marlboro Pino. I think they're that's a, they're very different, very different styles, and fun to fun to taste the difference. Let's move on to another question. Um, this is a good one. Does the Swins or the Sustainable Wine Growing uh, New Zealand program uh, apply not only to the wine growing portion, but to the tasting room, DTC wholesale, and additional business practices as well? Um, I, I'll just jump in with a little part. So it mainly consists of three parts. Obviously the vineyards and what happens there, the winery and the operations of the winery, but also uh, the business of wine. So the exporting, the local sales, etc. cetera. Um, at this stage, it does not carry through to things like cellar doors, but it, it does pertain to the, the business of wine. I don't know, Clive, if, if you want to add something yeah, else not, there. Not, not specifically to cellar doors, but other than the overall sort of you know, in terms of waste minimization and those those and social responsibility, I guess would, would might apply to um, cellar doors, but certainly it's yeah, it's 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 the sort of New Zealand based business model more so it doesn't really extend out to distribution at this stage in terms of certification. Gotcha. So as part of the circle of returning material to the vineyard, do you include the lees from your fermentation? So Erica, I think this was in reference when you were talking about uh, all the okay. compost that's going back into the vineyard. No, we don't do that. We the grape skins, the grape mark, we do, but not the least now. Yeah, we we okay. we do. Yeah, yeah, we we do. We we've actually just been doing that now because we're wrapping our wines off grosslies, and we're finding the um, we've got a big pile of compost out there, and it's it's very absorbent, so it actually absorbs all those lees very well. So it's it's just something we've only just started doing, but we think we'll continue to do it. Yeah we'll, set, yeah, we'll look at that next year, but at this stage, we've not been doing that, no. Uh, Miss Crawford, while the quadrupeds are mowing your grass, how do you keep them from munching on the grapes? I think we kind of mentioned this, you take them out, right? <laughs> They're not in there. Yeah. 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 There but, you is know, the, quite, yeah. You have to be quite careful when you put them in, because, <clears throat> for instance, if we put them in um, in winter, you have to put them in before you prune, because they can't see the wires and they just destroy the infrastructure. So you've just got to time it a little bit, the cows. That's funny. Um, let's see. Well, somebody just has a nice comment here. We applaud New Zealand for being leaders in lighter glass, self enclosures, and green growing. Lighter glass is more affordable. I would like to see more of it. I still see some pretty heavy glass in some of the premium wines in, the, in New Zealand, but I definitely think that we're moving, yeah. for, moving towards there. Um, 
Well, transport by boat is energy efficient. Does that take into consideration climate control, control for the wine during transport and the energy that requires? Anybody answer that? Can you come I, I think it would have to. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you're expending energy on refrigeration during transport, you'd have to include that as part of your calculator as well too. Yeah. Okay, and let's. But you know they're one. using quite innovative things while freighting, like you know, th um, thermal blankets and that sort of stuff. So we are, we are, you know, people are doing things to to minimise the use of refrigeration. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It's quite, you know, you can do you can do passive um, mitigation as well as expending energy. So it doesn't always have to be about turning the fridge on. Yeah. It actually looks like it's four o'clock on the dot. So I'm gonna be very prompt here and say that we'll wrap it up with that. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's questions, but I'm glad we got a few and thank you all for answering them so concisely. That, that's always really helpful as well. Um, so I would just like to thank our panelists, uh, Julian Clive and Erica for getting up very early this morning. I've been watching the window behind Julian. It was pitch yes. black when we started <laughs> this and the sun is coming up there. Uh, middle of winter, they're starting to prune all that fun winter stuff happening out there. So I really appreciate you guys taking a break from all that, getting up early and joining us and, uh, and providing us with some really great insight onto sustainability in New Zealand. Thanks very much, team. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.